Welcome to the St. Louis University Craft Talks, part of the St. Louis Literary Award Series of Programming with our host, Ted Iber, and special guest, Phyllis Welliver. The St. Louis Literary Award was created by the Library Associates of St. Louis University in 1967. To learn more about the Literary Award and the writers that we have honored over the years, check out the book, The St. Louis Literary Award by St. Louis University Archivist Emeritus, John Wade. We would also like to thank our sponsors for the Craft Talk series, Left Bank Books and Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company. Left Bank Books is one of the oldest and largest independently owned bookstores in the nation, offering a full line of new and used books, gifts, cards, magazines, toys, and services. You can order Phyllis Wellover books at a 20% discount if you let them know that you saw this interview. Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company is dedicated to creating a memorable coffee experience for their customers and guests, committing to sustainable business practices, providing educational opportunities, and supporting the communities in which they serve. And now, without further ado, Phyllis Welliver. Phyllis Welliver is a professor of English at St. Louis University. Her research explores literature and music in Victorian Britain as mutually constitutive with a range of 19th century discourses, including constructions of gender, class, childhood, ethnicity, and political and religious identity. This work has contributed to uh, BBC Two television series in the UK and to the essay on BBC Radio 3 for which she wrote and presented. Professor Welliver has lectured internationally, including by invitation at the British Academy and Royal Academy of Music, and has twice been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. She's a fellow of Gladstone's Library in Wales and has been a visiting research fellow at the Faculty of Music, the University of Cambridge, and as a visiting scholar at St. Catherine's College at Cambridge. Some of Professor Welliver's academic books include Mary Gladstone and the Victorian Salon, Music, Literature, and Liberalism from Cambridge Press 2017, The Musical Crowd in English Fiction, 1840 to 1910, Class, Culture, and Nation, that's from Palgrave Macmillan in 2006, and Women Musicians in Victorian Fiction, 1860 to 1900, Representations of Music, Science, and Gender in the Leisured Home, that's uh, most recently from Rutledge Press in 2016. Along with publishing articles in top journals, she's edited two collections of essays, The Figure of Music in 19th Century British Poetry, uh, that was from Ashgate uh, Press in 2005, and most recently in Rutledge, 2016, and with Catherine Ellis, Words and Notes in the Long 19th Century from Boydell and Brewer in 2013. Currently, Professor Welliver is co-editing a special issue of Victorian Poetry with Linda K. Hughes on The Salon, and that'll be out in summer 2022. In 2021, Phyllis Welliver published a creative nonfiction book called The Arrow Tree, Healing from Long COVID. Uh, she began writing poetry and founded Ex uh, Exiat Imprints, an indie press for academic authors. Also in the field of digital humanities, she's leading the Sounding Tennyson Project and collaborating with Ewan Jones on the uh, Tennyson Collection hosted by the Cambridge Digital Library. From 2019, Professor Welliver has been director of the Walter J. Ong S.J. Center for Digital Humanities at St. Louis University. She's originally from Michigan, but now she lives in Missouri with her husband and son. I am Ted Iber. I'm the executive director for the St. Louis Literary Award, and I'm excited to be with you here this morning in St. Louis, Missouri. I am interviewing Professor Phyllis Welliver, professor of English at St. Louis University. And um, if you have been tuning in to Craft Talks at St. Louis University, you know that I like to start with questions on writing process. So first off, before we get there, good morning, Professor Welliver. Good morning, Ted. It's lovely to be here. We've been, uh, we've been talking about this for months, so I'm so excited to be sitting at least across from the screen with you <laughs> at, in our respective offices and, uh, and chatting with one another. So you've been uh, writing and publishing academic works for most of your adult life. So I wanted to know how you started writing and at what point did you know that you wanted to make a career of it? So I, I have a musical background as well and originally thought I wanted to be an opera singer. And so I came to the idea that I wanted to write professionally a bit later. Um, and there were kind of two moments that were particularly important. One was when I went on a, an abroad semester to London 
And this was a semester that was concentrating on the English degree part of my undergraduate career. Um, I was doing a double degree program at Oberlin and that meant that I was enrolled simultaneously in the Conservatory of Music and the college, the Liberal Arts College. And um, I thought that was going to be a, a case where I was preparing to be an opera singer and my uh, backup career, which my musician father required me to have was, was English, uh, which my colleagues oh, find to be very, very funny. I have it, to tell it, you. It is fun. as, as an English major, I do find it funny, but I yeah. love it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, those were different times too. I mean, I think people understood the value of a degree in the humanities in a different way than they do today. Yep. And certainly English was, is still a very versatile kind of background to have. Um, for me, I, I went on this uh, broad semester to London and for the first time was taking more English classes than I was music classes. And I just fell in love with it. And we got to see, um, there was a, a London stage class. We were able to see, I think something like 30 productions in the course of a semester. Oh, um, wow. And wow. Uh, it was amazing. And talk to some of the greats. Uh, Fiona Shaw came to talk to us, for instance, um, as a class and, uh, and it just really made me realize how much I love that part of my life as well. Sure. And then when I graduated from Oberlin, um, I decided to go to New York, as many people do, and um, had a job in one of the big uh, musical um, artist management firms. And I thought, well, this would be a good way to get to New York, um, to continue to coach. And... Um, kind of try and combine the two areas, see if maybe arts management was a viable career option. And I quickly realized within the course of maybe two weeks how unhappy I was at it because it was doing neither English nor, um, nor the music. And uh, at that time, what I began to really crave was the English. So I took a couple years to study for the GREs and save some money, went back home to Interlochen. I grew up in Interlochen, Michigan, um, and, uh, and wrote program notes for the second year that I had out, and then went to Cambridge um, after that. And uh, for me, I suppose it came about through those kind of accidents where I realized how much I really enjoyed English. And not to say that I don't really enjoy music too, but it was English that I ended up craving. And so I thought if I pursued that as a career, I could continue to sing as well, um, which I was able to continue to do up through the beginning of graduate school in a, a kind of serious way. And then, um, then academia took over. But I, I love writing. And to me, writing has a lot of similarities to music um, in, in terms of the flow state that you get into and the way that you craft. So to me, it's, it's intellectual thinking for sure, mm -hmm. but it's also very much a creative endeavor. I, I find that in all the writing I do, whether it's academic or, or more creative work. Mm -hmm. I'll be touching down on all of that uh, a little bit later, and I'll try to finesse my questions so we're not treading the same ground. Um, fascinating, and, and uh, it'll be a different conversation at some point, but there's so many parallels that I find myself between music and English, uh, yes. just particularly, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about when you're in, in your early twenties, when you're yes. making all these major life decisions, you know, I can still relate. Uh, well, I, th I yeah. think as well, you know, it's, um, I mean, luckily the, we're all put together differently, but if you follow the things that you really crave some, for me, that's English and music, you end up having, um, a really interesting and unique contribution to make to this world. Could and, agree more. Yes. Yeah. Well, first off, uh, or second off, maybe I should say, congratulations on the release of your brand new book. That's going to be my next question. It's the Arrow Tree Healing from Long COVID. So, in your memory, excuse me, in your memoir of recovering from long haul COVID, uh, you say that, and this is a quote: "Writing was the most important piece of your treatment. It was a self prescription." Most of the content of the book comes from personal journals 
that you've kept during your recovery. So this is a question about journaling. What role did journaling play in processing emotions and experiences? Okay. Um, I began journaling in ninth grade at Interlochen Arts Academy, which I was extremely privileged to attend because my parents uh, were the two librarians there. My dad was head of the music librarian library and my mom was head of the academic library. Oh my gosh, that's remarkable. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it was a, a privilege that I think I've only begun to realize more with time. Um, and so for my freshman English class, uh, there was an assignment to journal. Um, and I took it very seriously and I fell in love with journaling. Mm. And um, for most of my life, I haven't stopped. I mean, there have been, you know, periods where I've been more active than, than not. Um, but it's very natural for me to think in this personal way with pen and paper and um, in this very private writing. I don't normally share it with anybody. And when I became ill, I was not able to do very much. Um, I was getting headaches if I tried to think very much and in a critical kind of way. But what was extraordinary to me was that my journaling was not giving me those kinds of headaches. Um, in fact, just the opposite. It was not just filling my time, but actually making me feel better while I was doing it. And it's hard to describe. I don't think I could describe why that was happening in that way. But it seems to me that there's real truth that the arts are therapeutic. All arts are therapeutic. Creativity is therapeutic. And so um, I ended up uh, being told quite forcibly by my doctor that I needed to take a medical leave, which I was resisting. I did not want to take a medical leave. Sure. Um, and it took a lot of persistence. And I finally realized if I did want to become better, I was going to have to keep take off um, a period of, of several months, it ended up being five months. And I was uh, told by my doctor, well, you could read during this time. And I thought, no, I can't, because if I read, I've got my critical mind engaged and I'm getting these headaches. And my, um, my work told me very specifically that I was not to do any research, which frankly, I couldn't have done anyway. I just, I did not have the, um, it turns out that thinking actually does take a lot of energy. And I've always um, argued that, but this was a real evidence, physical evidence. Um, and so what was I to do with myself? So I thought, well, uh, I've always wanted to do something more creative. The journaling is actually helpful right now. Why don't I try doing something that's more creative with the journaling? And, um, and it was meant to be private. It was not originally meant to be published. Um, but over the course of that illness, um, I began to realize that people were really needing stories told about long COVID. Uh, I was in the first wave. I became ill in March of 2020. And um, in the long COVID community, it's if you're ill before of April of 2020, you're considered a first waiver. And it, these this becoming ill at this time um, happened when long COVID did not have a name. People did not understand that these symptoms could go on for so long. Um, and we were really struggling with a lot of mysteries and being disbelieved. Um, and so the, the writing, the journaling was an attempt to find a way to heal. And then I began to think, well, maybe this is something that other people would value um, reading because it's a tale, it's a hopeful tale. Um, there's a lot of feelings of uh, sometimes discouragement and depression along the way, that's honest. Um, but I also had a lot of joy, a lot of joy in family, a lot of joy in the natural environment. And that joy was very important for getting better. That is that's that's a, a a theme that is woven all the way through, um, that that there was joy uh, despite going through such a such a terrible experience, um, and I, that to me that joy was a real key. I mean, it's it's counterintuitive, but um, you know, I referenced along the way uh, Jill Fredston's observation in Avalanche Rescue that she does in Alaska. 
-hmm. about how for those people who survive catastrophes like like avalanches she she made a list of the things that they seem to have in common and one of the things that they had in common was that they found something beautiful at the in the experience and that is a state of mind as much as anything else and for me i find that healing to find beauty and to calm uh calm myself and to um be in a state where I'm encouraging the um, create encouraging a creative and a connected kind of state of mind rather than that kind of paralyzed with fear state of mind. And so I very consciously nurtured that. And writing for me was verbal play. And um, my own scholarship is rooted in the 19th century. And so certainly, uh, one thing that's always appealed to me in the 19th century is the nature writing and the description of scenery and um, the beauty of the sentence. And these are things that I tried to cultivate in my writing and to do some, um, to pay homage really to the, the beauty of, of wild Michigan, which is where I was at the time recuperating. I found it uh, fascinating that, that you struggled I mean, you f physiologically struggled with more uh, with writing that that required what you describe as more critical thinking, um, and yet you you veered toward uh, a type of creative writing that you really hadn't been doing, which seems like it would require a totally different kind of critical thinking. I mean, I know it's different, but it it is it is you know again I said it was fascinating to me that that one kind of writing really was, was physically uncomfortable um, and another kind of writing brought you just almost the exact opposite reaction. Well, I do think that there's something about the tools of writing too. Um, so I journal with pen and paper in hand and it allows me to write in a different sort of way. I don't think I could write in this style if I were at the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And it's it's at my computer that I construct all of the intellectual work. Um, now there is some poetry criticism in the book, little, little baby poetry criticisms, <laughs> um, because I, it's just who I am and how I think. And so I would see something and it would call to mind a poem that I knew already. And, um, and I would want to describe what it was about the poem that made me think of it at that time. So there is a little critical work in there. And it's, if I were writing for an academic audience, I would have gone further with it. So it's, it's not that it isn't there, but it's um, used for a different purpose. And um, I suppose otherwise, the the kind of thought that's reflected in it is simply how I think and who I am. Mm -hmm. And it's very different from looking at a new poem or a new fictional work and thinking through um, how to pull that together into a long argument. I like writing long arguments in books. Mm -hmm. I prefer that to essays. And um, I suppose the difference was that everything that I was writing about in the arrow tree had was personal. And I think that, gosh, I don't know, Ted, how do you talk about the difference? I mean, they're both coming out of the same person. I mean, I'm producing them both. Um, well, I do think, I mean, yeah. you've, you've hit upon this a bit. I mean, I do think that there's a different mindset when you're writing more, uh, when you're writing creatively. Not that you can't write creatively. I would always make the arguments to students that, that when you're writing expository essays or research-based essays, uh, you can you can you can put your own voice in it. I mean, you know, there are some people that uh, that may not appreciate that as much. I, I am a fan of it, and I would also make the argument uh, as a creative nonfiction writer that creative nonfiction can can very much appeal to academic. And scholarly writing I, as well. I agree. And that's something yeah. I want to try and wed a little bit more as I go forward. Yeah. I think a big the big difference to me is that I really put a lot of personal life into the arrow tree. Mm -hmm. 
and as a result felt really vulnerable about it. I right. mean, it was not an easy decision to decide to publish it. Um, and as, as you'll have noted, I dedicated it to the reader because this was very much um, motivated by trying to be of help to other people. Mm -hmm. And um, in my academic writing, I don't feel that vulnerability. There's, there's not that, it, it doesn't talk about my friends and my family and my innermost thinking and, and um, my memories of place. This is very place oriented writing okay. um, more than anything else, because the thing is with long COVID, you can't do a lot. And that was actually a lesson in the book was it's mm -hmm. more about a, a state of existence. So I, I had a question uh, a bit later, but I'll ask it now about, you know, about, about having an inner critic. We all have it, uh, particularly in the arts, I think. Um, and you were, you were laying out some very personal stories um, and, and, and dabbling in more poetic writing. So it, were, were, you, were you having, did you feel like you had a lot of self-doubt as you were putting this together? Were you, were you nervous about how this was going to be perceived because you, as a, as as a scholarly writer, you you are you know you are you are known in one way out there in the world, and you were putting yourself out there in a different way. Well, originally, I wasn't planning on putting it out there. <laughs> I mean, it um, it was only later um, that the idea formed, and I had this yeah. strange situation where multiple people were asking me um, or suggesting to me that I that I write about it. And I thought, boy, that's weird because I am writing about it. Um, but maybe people are kind of asking me to tell the story to them. I think the thing that was odd to me was the first chapter because it took the longest to write. And I realized that I wanted to experiment a little bit. And, and, um, and the th odd thing is, is that when I was writing creatively, um, I actually felt better at the time. I mean, you have to be really, really sick to feel how therapeutic the arts actually are, but I would feel better. And yet trying to do something new was a little bit baffling to me. So I spent a lot of time swinging in the hammock thinking, now how am I gonna do this? And, um, and I observed my setting and I suppose being a literary scholar, there's a slight advantage because you can draw from your knowledge of how other authors have tackled certain things. So for instance, I've always loved Dickens' per personification of buildings. And so I thought, well, when I'm describing the other cottages around us in this, in this summer cottage community, um, maybe I'll personify them, that could be fun. And so there were a few moments like that where I consciously thought, about um, other techniques or a technique that I particularly like is um, how George Eliot and Daniel Deronda uses parentheses to mark pauses and silence and thought while a conversation is going on. And so there's one scene in the book where I am talking with my son um, and he also had long COVID. And we were talking about um, some experiences that he'd had through distance learning. And so, in the course of the actual real conversation, I had been pausing and waiting for him to contribute. And I thought, well, that was a rather nice technique that George Eliot used, and maybe I'll try something similar to that. So there are, there are little moments in the book. Um, and so I think in some ways, I avoided that kind of doubt because I was trying things out and it was experimental. And then when I decided finally, well, I think I am going to publish this, um, it was crafting the sections that I had written. So when I was writing it, I was using fairly thin exercise books and I would dedicate one to each kind of theme or encounter. So the, the book is, the, the final structure of the book is um, focused around encounters with an, a, a particular animal or, um, an environment that I'm thinking about, like the woods or the lake as different chapters. And this was the form of the, the journals as well. And they were thin enough that I could think about something and come back around to it. Um, 
And I usually had a couple going at one time as I was pulling out different th threads of thought. And so when it came time to think about writing it for the public, um, I put it into the computer in these in these formats. And then this is where those writing skills kicked in from academia. And it was pretty easy for me, at least, to structure the chapters because um, because that's what I do <laughs> professionally. So that was kind of a nice marrying of, this, of those two skills. Um, and I did also send it out to a couple of um, people who I admire in who are professional writers who uh, responded to me with a couple of structural thoughts too. So I did get it kind of vetted along the way. Did you, uh, speaking of vetting, did you, did you have uh, a number of readers that were going through this for you? Uh, or, yeah. Um, I tried to choose people from different walks of life because this was meant not to be for a scholarly audience, but for, you know, a, a lot of different types of people, you know? And so I, I did choose a couple of professional writers, um, but then I also chose um, someone who works in medical humanities, and I chose someone who had been employed in the uh, Na National Health Service in, in England, um, who had been working closely with um, the nursing staffing. So she had that perspective. Um, I chose someone who also had long COVID. Um, you know, just, just a variety of people. Um, because I was at a, an arts high school, um, I sent it to a friend who was a creative writer from that period. And, um, and what was really interesting in the feedback that I got was that nobody was picking up on the same thing. So it, to me, that said, there isn't one element here that needs to be excised and changed, that this is personal opinion coming through. And um, so there were little sections that I made some tweaks to, um, but not, um, not a massive overhauling. It's, it's, it was a pretty quick process once I made that decision to actually um, go ahead and, and, and give it to people. <laughs> Uh, that's great. Um, well, let me let me uh, change gears here a little bit. I want to move into more writing style right now. So the arrow tree, to continue focusing on that, contains beautiful imagery, which makes the reader feel from the beginning as though they're right alongside you. And in fact, uh, in my opinion, this is a lovely companion piece to David Henry Thoreau's Walden uh, or nature themed uh, poetry of Mary Oliver. And I know, I mean, I clearly I'm not the only one who thinks that I, I yeah. noticed a, a review in Publishers Weekly that makes that comparison as well. So there's so many descriptions in the book that could be isolated as poems. Um, I mean, do dozens and dozens, if not more than more than 100. So just one example. Here's here's one from the, uh, the book. This is uh, you describe the lakeshore of your family's home in Michigan by this. This is a quote from the book. The fragrant mint and pine lining the shores the marbling effect of gold sunlight moving through green, green waves, the startled fish, the firm sand footing, and the lap, lap, lap of waves. So how do such vivid descriptions like uh, come to you in the writing process? Um, was, it, was it just because, was it, did it just flow out of you or were you finding that you were doing more revision on these very vivid descriptions or, or even less, did it just come right out? I did less on those. That came out. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, no, it's interesting because um, I mentioned in, this in the book, but when I was at Oberlin um, in the English Honors Program, we all write a, a long, semester-long research paper um, and work closely with a faculty advisor on it. Um, and I think it might surprise people because I'm a scholar who focuses on the Victorian period, but my English Honors thesis was comparing Walden with Wordsworth's Dove Cottage period, uh, a period in his writing when, um, which was transcendental and he, and, and there was a, a life component in it that was influencing the, uh, the writing predominantly very much like Thoreau was. Um, and so there's always been something in me that has gravitated in the first place to that nature writing. And, um, and I am, uh, yeah, I don't know how to tell you. It was very natural. It was just, it was there. And it was, um, it was that flow state that I was talking about where you, it was a transcendent state. 
and it was very much it is very much like listening to music to me it would it's that state and um and i have since started to write some more poetry and um it seems to be something that's stuck <laughs> i don't know if it was always there or not but it is there now and um and i'll wake up in the morning with whole lines of poetry in my head and um get up and write it down and so um i have some of it up on the website because i just thought i would offer it at, mm -hmm. again in the spirit of generosity and maybe other people um would like to read this and i started it as haiku um because i think haiku is also very place oriented and it plays with time in an interesting way um and i have since started to expand and play with other forms i like forms mm -hmm. so i have started to play with vill villanelle and sonnet and again um long covid is the topic for me at least at the moment because it's a very emotional topic when you're going through it there is still a lot that is unknown and a lot that's distressing and for me it's an outlet and i can release it into the writing and then create something that i hope has some beauty to it as well so you wrote and presented tennyson's in memoriam a h h the manuscript at trinity college cambridge at the cambridge uh cambridge university library in 2018 your analysis of Tennyson's In Memoriam draws connection between form and function. So here's your form and function. Uh, in that actual manuscript itself is tall and narrow, which allowed him uh, to fit entire cantos per page in order to better edit them and is a way to contain his grief at the death of his friend. So I want to jump back into, into that whole idea of form and function. Um, how do you make decisions about form in your own writing? And it sounds like it's probably evolving, if I could make that leap. It definitely is. I mean, so the so my training in, in English literature is very influenced by uh, having done a second BA at Cambridge. And Cambridge, as you probably know, is the um, the home of I.A. Richards and um, who, who started the the practice of, of practical criticism, as it's called in England, or as it transformed into new criticism in the in the USA in the early 20th century. And this is uh, looking at those aspects of literature that are maybe difficult to paraphrase, but contain meaning just the same. It's a formal analysis. And it is not apart from history. There is a um, an awareness that that there are uh, aspects of of how we communicate that relate very much to the time period. You know, um, uh, the use of of many verbs, for instance, you know, can can influence how a poem is read um, or how it's understood, and that is is linked to particular periods of time. Um, and so my own scholarship has very much, uh, I mean, that's our bread and butter, you know, that was my bread and butter, at least learning at, at Cambridge and um, is very much part of how I think about literature. So in terms of my own writing, I suppose it's only natural that it would be part of it. Um, the other thing about, I, I think the thing about writing for me is that the type of writing that's in the arrow tree comes out of journaling, which is a way of thinking through writing. So often my journals are about not just like what happened during the day, but something I'm trying to figure out. So I'll write it down and in the process, get a little further to understanding something and then be able to let it alone and forget about it and move on to the next thing and, and progress in life or maybe spiral because you kind of keep coming around to the same issues, you know, and maybe get further as you go. Um, and so in my writing style, uh, both academic and in terms of the arrow tree, I think there's a similar sense of weaving multiple strands together. And this is a thought process that may come out of Cambridge. It may come out of music. It, it may be partially just me. I don't know. Um, but I've certainly noticed um, 
at, at Cambridge when I've been there that there is a different style of discussion that goes on. And it's a style that one of my colleagues there and a friend now um, said, well, you know, maybe it came out of the, the long feasts and the dinners because you're sat down next to somebody who you may not know, and you need to form um, some way to have a meaningful conversation over the course of the evening. And what you notice in these, this kind of style of conversation is a kind of burrowing down into a topic. So instead of scattershot over a lot of topics, it's asking a question and asking another question and asking another question and getting deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And I think in my academic writing that combines with many strands of discussion that at the end all get woven together. And I saw myself doing that in the book chapters. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but looking back on it, I see that it's a similar um, thought process that's going on. And to a certain extent, I can't describe how it happens because it is actually an act of thinking and writing. Um, and some of it is, is maybe instinctual at this point. Um, in terms of the, the poetry, I, I like form, I like structure. Um, it's something, I think it, a sonnet is a good example of this. I mean, a sonnet has 14 lines, but then it gets divided eight and six. And that it's important that it's off kilter. You know, there's and a, has a has a rigid rhyme scheme and a and a and a meter to it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I think that the form helps you. So what I'm, um, if you know that this is what's going on, and you think I have eight lines, or maybe if I go over a little bit, you know, eight and a half lines um, to explore one one strand of thought, and then what's my turn going to be? What's my conclusion, you know, going to be to all of this? It actually is a really nice way to structure thought and to structure experience and emotion. And so I think that at the end, you, as you're looking at, and, and to work with it, because, you know, it's not done just once off, you're thinking, oh, that's, that's, it's not the right word. How do I find the right word? And, uh, um, and, and, you know, have it fit that rhyme scheme or, you know, I think rhyme scheme is so interesting because once you start practicing the poetry, you realize that, that that rhyme scheme is very helpful. It helps the, the cohesion of a poem. Um, and it helps it to sound poetic and not just because words are rhyming, but you have to come up with creative ways of saying something. And to me, that's, that's, that's like play. That's fun. <laughs> I like doing, it's like a puzzle in a way. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I went, when teaching, uh, you know, sticking with poetic form, I, I, you know, oftentimes uh, students who might be new to it uh, feel that it's very confining. And I always make the argument, no, I think it's, I think having a specific form that in which you have to adhere is actually much more liberating, much easier to work in, I think. Uh, you just need to practice it. You need it to be exposed yeah. to it. I wonder if it's almost like, um, you know, it's hard to write concisely in whatever form that you do. And I think that's something that we're teaching in the undergraduate classroom is, you know, I get the question almost every semester. Well, I know that the page limit is five pages or six pages or what have you. Can I go on to eight or nine? And I always am saying, well, no, because this is part of what you're learning right now. And um, and I think that's part of what appeals to me in the in, in poetic form is becoming very concise, but also vivid you know, at the same time, so that people understand that nugget of feeling, that thing that's hard to paraphrase. And the sound of the language is part of what communicates that. And so when I'm thinking about, um, I mean, it's one reason I, it's maybe the main reason I gravitated to the 19th century was I liked the sound of the language. So that's sentence structure and punctuation, um, the rhythm of the language is really important to me. I, I, I like reading with a sense of meter when I read poems, and I hope that I'm getting something of that across when I'm writing them too. 
And I hope that it's there in the arrow tree because I really had a sense of, um, of rhythmic style. I mean, I don't think I would have responded well to people trying to critique my style. And a couple people tried to, and I said, no, it's really gotta go this way. <laughs> uh yeah, I, I absolutely think so. And, and you know, something you may have heard this as well. We recently had Zadie Smith in for the St. Louis Literary Award. And um, she talked about how she really, what, regardless of what she's reading, she pays really close attention to punctuation mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and sentence length and, 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 and just conventions in general, as do I. And and I have to say, I think I, I tend to hone in on it more when I when I'm reading uh, the writing of academics like you. And I thought, wow, I was so I so appreciated the way you wrote this, and that there's so many different things going on. Again, I'm referring specifically to the arrow tree. Um, I loved it, and and as somebody who uh, I don't know that I would call myself a grammarian so so much, but I but I definitely pay very close attention to language and the way it's constructed. And I really appreciated the way you put this together. I, th I thought that, it was that means so yeah. much to me. Thank you, Ted. I I really appreciate that because that's what I was after, and that's part of what that kind of flow state is that I was mentioning and why it's like music. And so, um, you know, I did I did hear Zadie say that, and I um, feel a lot of kinship with that idea. Um, and to me, uh, I don't. I don't do well with short sentence structures. I, I don't hear the music in those language in the language there. Um, I appreciate a sentence with um, that sounds poetic. And in fact, when I teach Dickens, I usually have my students read it aloud because Dickens was a real master of punctuation. Um, and you know, there's this amazing chapter in the Tale of Two Cities where he's talking about footsteps in a in a vacant courtyard, and if you read it aloud, you you hear a footstep. Um, it's an unc uncanny mastery of language. It's it's like Tennyson in 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 Memoriam when he's got the ringing of the bells, and you hear the ringing of the bells because of the way that the 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 style helps the content. So it's something that you know when I'm teaching, I really. I'm trying to help students to understand that um, literary language is that more than the content um, in terms of you know what you know what the plot line is. It's how it's said, and it's what is so great about opera as well or epic. You know we know these stories, but we go again and again and again because of the beauty of how they are expressed. Uh, well said, and a perfect cap to that particular section to move on to miscellaneous and personal. <laughs> so you have been funded not once, but twice by the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is uh, remarkable. Do you have any advice for, for students or fellow academics who might be pursuing that? There's a narrative to grant writing. So you need to say what the project is about and you need to go in the order that the grant agency has asked you to present the information but there also needs to be something in the grant application, to my way of thinking at least, that makes the reader go, oh, that's kind of interesting. And so I try to find that thing and get it communicated quite early. Um, and I think it's there in, you know, in academic writing as well. I mean, when you're writing a, uh, an academic book or an article or a, a term paper, or whatever it might be, um, I know a question I always ask myself as I go along is, okay, so why does this matter? And I keep kind of probing at myself. Okay, what's the point? You know, Phyllis, what's the point in this? Why does this matter? Why does anybody care? And so it forces me to keep engaging with that. And, and that's and what I- you probably say that to students as well. I, I can almost hear it. Yeah, well, <laughs> it sounds well rehearsed, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but it's- um, I think grant writing is like that, where, you know, if you have a book topic, which is what most people are trying to get a grant for, you can't possibly say everything about it. So pick the the central things that are interesting to you about the, the project, you know, and the they will be in the book, and then focus on that for the grant. And um, yeah, 
I mean, and then look at examples because there are ways to be very, very succinct that other people have already cracked. So um, find an example from someone who's, who's done it before. And I, I think as well that the advice that the NEH has usually gives is that if you're successful, go back to the same agency because they can see that you've been successful once and they like to fund again, as long as it's not outside their rules. Um, and also get feedback. So if they offer you a chance for feedback, take it. And if you are not successful the first time with a grant application, then take the feedback that they offer, improve it, and send it back again. Um, both of my NEH grants um, I got after a refusal each time. So um, I think sometimes people take the refusal and think, well, that's it. I won't try again. But it's important to keep trying. Great advice. In the acknowledgments of the arrow tree, you state that, that your three times great grandfather, Henry Dyer Lowing, was a founder of the, is it Linesville Tri Tribune newspaper? Okay, good. Yeah. In 1880, and that the cap drops at the beginning of each chapter were actually printed using the family press. I love yeah. that. Uh, you also talk about your maternal grandmother, Phyllis, your namesake, uh, who died before you were born. And as you note in the book, she had an MA in English uh, and uh, in English literature and was planning on pursuing her doctorate before she died. Uh, a fascinating family history for sure. Did it feel inevitable or like this was the path you were going to take that you were going to pursue a, a, a career in writing? No, I thought it was going to be music. So um, my mother's side. So I had always heard the stories about my grandmother um, and she was remarkable because she was um, she and my grandfather ran a functioning farm and then they both taught at the local small high school. So they had two jobs and um, and she always aspired to more than the farm life, I think. But at the local high school, she taught French and drama, always did the plays. Um, the Renaissance was her period. And, um, and I'm very proud of that heritage. And it was only recently, um, I didn't grow up with the knowledge that, I, that my family also had the, the local paper. But I was really, really intrigued when I found that out. Um, I also have musicians on both sides. And so my mother's brother, John Van Bockern, um, was an eminent clarinetist. Um, and, um, and he and my dad were uh, housemates in the army band during the Kennedy years. And so my dad was a very, is a very fine French horn player. And they both were in the army band together. And then later on, um, kind of coincidentally, both ended up in the um, Quebec Symphony up in Quebec, Canada. And music has always been encouraged in my family. And having grown up in Interlochen as well, it was always part of my background. So, you know, I grew up hearing quartet rehearsals when my dad would have people over to the house and, you know, people would walk through that the house. I mean, I don't know if you know the name Fred Fennell, but he is one of the great um, wind conductors. Um, he was at Eastman and is the founder of the um, the wind ensemble. I'm getting that wrong, but he's, he's a famous conductor. Um, and he used to come over to the house for strawberry shortcake. I mean, this was kind of part of my family life and in a way much more tangible to me than the writing aspect was. Um, I had started piano at four, you know, and viola at nine and was singing, um, taking private lessons at Interlochen and became a voice major from age 13. And, and that was, that was what I thought I was going to do. So to me, that history was the more, um, I was much more aware of. There's a, on my mother's side, there's the story of a, um, however many great uncle, you know, however many removed, um, who was blind and he used to play at night because he wasn't aware that it was night and he would keep the family up playing his violin in the middle of the night. I mean, it's just music has always been the thing that people have been proud of on, on both sides of the family. Um, so I guess it was inevitable, really, that I would end up the way I have. <laughs> you know, maybe I should have I should have reworded the question. Not inevitable that it was writing, but inevitable that it would be writing, music, and education, because there's such a strong family background in all of it. 
I, I think there's a lot to that. I mean, yeah. and the the um the nature aspect is also very important to me, you know, and I have had um family members who have been um botanists and scientists in natural biology as well. Um so yeah, I don't know. Is it nature or nurture? It seems to be kind of both in this situation. I think we should we should both go back and watch uh, when Margaret Atwood was was in St. Louis for the Literary Award in, in 2017 because she talks about that very issue about uh, about being raised by scientists um, and having such a such a direct connection to nature, which had such a strong impact on her writing and her curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'd, you'd find some strong commonalities there. So that's exactly what I was thinking of as you were talking about that. This I'll is have to, a really I, interesting I, section, yeah. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look at that. It's interesting because my PhD dissertation was on, um, I mean, all of my academic writing is on music and literature and something else. And the PhD dissertation, which became my first book, um, was about, evolutionary biology and early mental science and how it played into the way that music and literature are discussed in the Victorian period, um, especially for women musicians. And, you know, I hadn't thought to connect it before, but that's been there as an interest all the way through too. You know, you've, you've talked uh, pretty extensively about the in influence of music. And I, I have to ask, I normally ask this toward the end of the interview and we're, we're getting pretty close, but I have to ask, what's on your what's on your playlist when <laughs> when uh, when you're listening to music? Depends and what, wait a minute, I, I actually also wanted to ask not only what's on your playlist, but do you ever listen to music while you write? I never listen to music while I write. They would be too. They category. would compete. Yeah, no, I just I um I would find my attention drawn to the music, whereas if I want to listen to what's inside I need not to have I need to have it quiet or I need to be in a natural setting where I'm hearing natural noises um the so yes yeah, so that um so in terms of what I listen to it really depends on what time of day you catch me so um I like to listen to classical music in the morning and some of that is family related because when I was growing up, there was a period of time that I used to go over to my dad's music library um, before school and catching the bus. And uh, there was always the classical music station, Interlock and Public Radio playing, uh, which is a fantastic classical music station. I'm, and I'm no and yes, and then I, I worked in my dad's library in the summers um, while I was a college student. And I used to get a little extra cash by doing the bowing and fingering so you know you get orchestral music and the section leader for uh the string sections uh, indicates what the bowing bowing should be and the fingering should be so that the sound is cohesive and that's why you see all the bows going in the same direction and in an orchestra someone has marked this is what we're going to do um and while we would bow and finger for hours, um, down bows and up bows and, you know, three, two, one, et cetera, um, and slurs, you would um, be listening to classical music. And so um, I got just this morning, I listened to one of my favorites, which is um, uh, I, I love vocalises. So um, I was listening to um, the uh, Villa Lobos Bacchianus Brasilianus number five, which is just brilliant. Um, and also the Bacuno Ave Maria. Um, and those are both on a CD I've owned since I was in college uh, with Kathleen Battle singing, who I actually was able to see live at one point. She's oh, wow. still a favorite of mine. Right. Remarkable singer. Yeah, yeah um, I love opera. Um, I've always loved La Boheme, and I love Domingo's version of that. Uh, Domingo has such a velvety voice. Um, in the evening, to relax, I might listen to Bach um, or Gershwin. They both kind of put me back in order. I, I know it's it's the rhythm, something in the rhythm. If I am really had a difficult day and I just want to kind of, you know, jam out a little bit, um, I, uh, I've, lis I've been listening to Lulu Wiles recently, which is a three-person female um, kind of folk rock band. They've been recording mm -hmm. on the Smithsonian label, like them mm -hmm. a lot. Um, 
but it's also about the the artist, not just the music. So I've been really interested to follow friends of mine from Interlochen as they've developed their careers. So Ken Tarver is a tenor um, who I was fortunate enough to be in the same studio with at both Interlochen and Oberlin. Um, and he's gone on to have a fantastic career. He sings Mozart so beautifully. He's got the spin in his voice. Um, Blair McMillan was one of my brother's best friends, and he has gone on to have a wonderful piano career um, in New York. And one thing I like about Blair is that he'll kind of horse around and on YouTube will release videos of, of you know, of him singing show tunes or rock tunes or something and for me the creativity that I really admire um, is the creativity where the the person the personality of the person still comes through it's not that there's ego involved but that there's something genuine and when I was working at this arts management agency, um, Derek Lee Reagan, who's a countertenor, um, just had such a fantastic, I'm sure she still has, a fantastic personality. The Juilliard Quartet, again, very humane people. And to me, great artistry comes out of being very human and being able to be vulnerable and being able to horse around. Um, I think there's great humor and, um, and fr fragility and uh, vulnerability and, um, you know, all of that, what it means to be a human being, that's the artistry I love. No doubt. And, and I do want to point out that we've, we've talked about interlocking quite a bit uh, because it's played such an important role in your development, your life, it still does, uh, that it's one of the preeminent um, music schools for younger people uh, in the world. Um, so I do want to make sure that that gets out there for anyone who's watching this, who isn't familiar with Interlochen. Uh, I, I should have, yeah, I should have said that at the beginning. Interlochen um, was founded in 1928 um, as a high school orchestral camp, summer camp. And then it went on to um, include visual art and creative writing and dance and drama and more recently motion picture arts. Um, and it's a summer camp in the summertime and then a winter boarding high school for ninth grade through 12th grade. My, uh, my niece w went there for dance and, and, I, and we really, I was so close to sending our kids there uh, for, for voice. Uh, and of oh, course, fantastic. reading your book, I just thought, oh, we should have done it. Should have done it. Too late now, but should have done it. <laughs> you founded Exiat Imprints, a self-proclaimed indie publishing company in April of 2021. It specializes in creative nonfiction and memoir, including hybrid and experimental forms. The website touts a specific interest in the medical humanities and environment humanities. So how did you become, and I think I already know the answer, but I'm putting it out there anyway, how did you become interested in those specific areas? Well, um, so exiat means to take a little uh, vacation or a little break. And um, we, we have exiat interviews um, at Cambridge. You get an exiat interview, a very personal, uh, it's a personal tutor. Um, uh, so we, so not like your, your academic advisor, but a personal tutor who would ask, um, you know, hey, how are things going and check in on you. Um, and then um, you'd have your summer holiday or you'd have your winter holiday. And um, to me, Exiat signaled a break from the academic institution. So it's meant to inspire crossover writing where academics can uh, reach a larger audience um, and do so in a way through that engaging style. And I became, and it doesn't only have to be medical humanities and environmental humanities, but um, I released my book on this imprint um, originally because I didn't, I wanted it to get out quickly while it was still, um, it might help people still, um, rather than going through the traditional publishing route. Um, and the, and I actually countered a lot of questions about that because the people who were reading it were saying, you know, you could take this to a um, established press and don't you wanna do that? And I kept thinking, no, I actually really wanna get it out quickly. Um, and that led from one thing to another. And I began to think about the fact that um, 
often academics say they have that you know that creative work in their back pocket that they haven't done yet or they're wondering how to do it and i uh on the one hand wanted to encourage that and on the other hand i was really i have been very concerned about the state of the humanities and the arts in our world and feeling very much that we need to find ways to encourage them and to encourage the contribution that they can make to the world and in the us we have this great tradition of the liberal arts education um the liberal arts college and that idea is to form a well-educated person who can then go out into the world maybe pursue a career related to what they did in college maybe something entirely different but be a thoughtful um, person on a variety of topics and know how to educate themselves and so my thought was to encourage people to um to contribute to the world in kind of a parallel to the university. Um, that's why it's an exiat from it, you know, a little brief pause. And, um, and there is no press at the moment with a medical humanities list. And clearly two of the things that are of most concern in the world right now um, are what is not only a current pandemic, but what's going to be the fallout from it. And that includes a mental health crisis um, that some people are saying is another pandemic going on right now. Um, and there are going to be more and more people with long COVID. And so this is going to impact um, not only those individuals and their families and workplaces, national economies, um, but it also has the possibility to draw into public awareness other chronic illnesses that have not gotten the same kind of um, of airspace that uh, that a, an epidemic does. So there's that thought, and then the environmental humanities, of course, climate change um, and what is happening to our world is of great concern. And there's obviously link up between them. So I thought, you know, let's start with those and exiat. Um, is in the process of moving to a nonprofit, um, and so uh, so that is that's it that will happen in future. It's not there right now in the description, um, and that I think meets the 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 vision, which is very public facing. And so I've I've gathered a really great team of people um, on the advisory board, people with expertise in academic publishing. Um, some crossover to uh, to trade publishing and um, really great editors for each series. Um, just kind of trying to put it into place bit by bit. And again, it's meant to be public serving um, and to also give academics kind of the permission to try something a little different. So we're still crafting it and figuring it out. And my book is proving um, is helping us to learn through the process. It's kind of it's test case as it as we go. Um, and in future, I will not be publishing under this imprint. This is a test case, and then we're opening it up to other people. All right. So I think we've got one more question to go, and I think this seems like a fitting place to end. I wanted to know what's on your literal or maybe your metaphorical uh, nightstand. What what is it you're reading right now? I just started Tarka the Otter uh, by Williamson, and um, I'm really enjoying it. This is a, a novel from the early 20th century that was influential to Ted Hughes. Um, mm -hmm. And I have been gravitating towards more natural writing like that. Um, I often am reading things for the classroom. I mean, just reviewing. Um, so because sure. I have taken upon myself the very long Victorian novel. I am often rereading a Victorian novel. Uh, Tennyson at the moment, I'm rereading um, because I'm teaching Tennyson. And while this may sound like, oh, she's doing her work at night, the actual fact is I love this. I mean, I just, the re there's a reason I am uh, someone who works on 19th century, um, the long 19th century. I also like um, the early 20th century. Yeah, I have a lot of time for Virginia Woolf. And um, I, I was influenced by braiding sweetgrass, which I enjoyed very much. Um, it's not on my nightstand at the moment. I finished it a while ago, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the overstory more recently. Um, 
DJ Lee has written a beautiful um, work called Remote um, about the Bittersweet Mountains, um, which was one of the best reads I've, I've um, one of my, the best reads ever. <laughs> it was great. Um, and it's another one of these academic um, crossover writings that's really beautiful, nature writing. Um, I'm always reading, it seems. Uh, George Eliot's, George Eliot, all time favorite. <laughs> It is such a privilege to be able to work and yet call it play at the same time. And um, for the most part, that's what I can do. It's a fantastic um, blessing, really. All right, first off, Phyllis, I wanna thank you so much for your time and generosity this morning. This was, this was great fun for me to do. I really enjoyed it too. Thank you so much, Ted. And I also want to take a moment to thank Tara Ernst, uh, our brilliant graduate assistant who takes so much time in, in doing research before uh, these, these podcasts. So thank you, Tara. And thank you, Phyllis. And uh, thank you, everybody who is either listening or watching. And we'll see you soon.